This is the European History Lecture for Thursday, the 24th of February, 2022. And um, where we were was talking about the empires, the British Empire, the German Empire, the French Empire. The competition for imperial possessions, which is often summarized as the scramble for Africa, to make sure you have your notes out is an attempt to claim parts of the world that you can now take because of technologies. Now, I'm going to steal the thunder of something that I'll talk about later when we do Africa. Because I told you about the uh, various inventions and, and progresses of uh, technologies of war. But there is a particular medical technology that really is the basis of all of this. And it is quinine. Quinine, which can be taken in cocktails, alcoholic drinks, uh, is a chemical that you can ingest that makes you resistant to malaria. Malaria is the sleeping sickness carried by mosquitoes, among others. And if you are not of the regions that have malaria, which are basically every tropical jungle on the planet, you're going to be laid low by malaria. You will be in a state of semi-consciousness or unconsciousness. You will sleep You will, when you're awake, have the shivers and shakes, Ruby. You will, Ellie, you will be in horrible, horrible shape, and you will probably not recover, and then you will die. Now, the truth is that natives of these regions also get malaria, but it's a normal part of their lives. It's one of the things that tends to make their lives short, mean, and brutal. But for Europeans, going into these malarial jungles was death, which is why during the Spanish and Portuguese and Dutch... Oh, that's right. Uh, I'm distracted by doing two things at once. Uh, eras of exploration, discovery, and conquest you do not see Africa as being a going prospect, nor do you see um, rapid colonization of the tropical islands of Indonesia or the Philippines. The Spanish, the Dutch, and the Portuguese divide the area. But the truth is, deep penetration of these jungles is almost impossible by Europeans because Europeans simply cannot handle the malaria. But in the early 19th century to mid-19th century, Europeans begin to consume quinine. In fact, if you are familiar with mixed, with, with various weird kinds of sodas, you'll note that there's something called tonic water that uh, sometimes adults have with their bars. And tonic water tastes sort of bitter. Well, tonic water is also known as quinine water. And what people would do, especially the British, is they would mix gin with it in order to make drinking the quinine more palatable. By taking quinine daily, the Brits and the others learn that they can have a reasonable resistance to the sleeping sickness. You're so mean. She's eating at her dog. I find your bloody, beaten mouth body on the ground. I'm going to know why. <laughs> She'll have had enough of your stuff. Uh, anyway, not my business, not my dog. And she looks pretty happy. Yes, she does. Ah, uh, let's see. 
So with quinine, the conquest of the tropics is on, as well as with the various implements of war that I showed you. So what else is going to inspire? Well, oddly enough, an obscure naval historian who teaches at Annapolis, uh, our Naval Academy, Ava, is going to write a book that's going to inspire and change the world. It's called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Its author, make sure you have your note there, is Alfred Thayer Mahan. Mahan is a Navy captain who later may, uh, becomes Admiral. And his thesis, studying the Anglo-Dutch wars and the various wars between England and France, culminating very welcome in the Napoleonic Wars, is that it is sea power that determines global power. Control of Europe means nothing if you can't project that power out into the colonial regions of the world where certain necessary raw materials can only be obtained. Europe's climate prevents Europe from being self-sufficient. A European autarky, that is an European economic self-sufficiency, would be a Europe without sugar. Just as one example, a Europe without rubber. rubber. A Europe without certain mineral raw, mineral raw materials. So... Control of the global routes of trade means. Sorry, if I've knocked that over. Just in case. Control over the global trade routes means control of the seas. Now, how does one get control of the seas? For hundreds of years, the French experimented with a way of fighting Britain without having to without having to deal with Britain's superior battle fleet. The French called it guerre de course. What it really is is a form of guerrilla warfare at sea, where the French attacked commerce and tried to evade the British fleet. But France never won in that way. When France did have naval victories, it was a result of taking on the British battle fleet and winning, like um, at the Battle of Yorktown, where the French fleet combines with the Franco-American army to defeat the British and win the American Revolution. Mahan says the only way that a nation is going to truly prosper is by building a battle fleet of heavy gunned warships that will win in a decisive battle, like Trafalgar. And in winning that decisive battle, settle once and for all, at least for the time being, who rules the waves. And once you determine who rules the waves, you can then make rules for what happens on the waves. You can shape global trade to suit you. You can become an economic superpower, like Britain did like France failed to do, because Britain had sea power. Mahan's book is going to intensify an already intense conflict between uh, the European great powers. Because social Darwinism, Nietzschean will to power philosophy, and good old-fashioned competition has made the Europeans restive and wanting to redraw the balance between various nations. The British look on all of the others as wannabes, and the others look on Britain as their target. They want to do what Britain has already done. What this is going to do is cause nations to begin to, to spend unprecedented amounts of money on increasingly high-tech warships, 
with the development of steam power, metal armor, first iron, then steel, with the development of breech loader rifles, taking the place of smooth bore muzzle loaders, with the development of the Whitehead torpedo, Holland's submarine, and ultimately Count von Zeppelin's airships and Orville and Wilbur Wright's aircraft, the nations of the world are going to see opportunities to overcome the British advantage in battleships. And the British are going to see a need to continue to build their battle fleet to stay ahead of everyone else. All of them come to see this. And by the way, this becomes... you understand what a real illusion is? A real illusion is when you convince everyone that the Emperor has no clothes. The Emperor is walking down the street, Starkers, stark naked. But everyone comments on how wonderful his clothing is. This is from a, a child's fairy tale. And if everyone sees the Emperor's new clothes as absolute finery, then of course I must just be silly in seeing him buck naked. So when it comes your turn to comment on the, comment on the Emperor's new clothes, you of course are going to, unless you want to be thought of to be insane, you are going to share in the delusion. Yeah, what wonderful finery he's wearing. Cloth of gold, ermine, beautiful clothes. He stark naked. Mahan's book beguiles the leadership, political and military, of the European great powers, of Europe's imperial powers. And in intensifying construction and deployment of powerful naval forces, he intensifies the need for new raw materials and the acute competition for strategic locations from which to base these naval forces. Because there's one difference. All of these high-tech warships are much shorter-legged than the Napoleonic warships they replaced. Napoleonic warships are sailing ships. They can travel anywhere so long as there is wind. What limits their range is provisions. Are there food? Is there clean water? Are there medical supplies? Does the ship have everything it needs? As long as the ship has crew and provisions, it can go infinitely, almost. But modern ships are powered by coal. And coal is notoriously short range. So what the navies of the world need to do is set up imperial territory so that they have coaling stations that can allow their navies long reach. This is going to become particularly important when we talk about the Russo-Japanese War. Okay. Now we're going to look at regional case studies, and we'll start with East Asia, unless there are questions. China. China, during the 1500s, becomes host to ever-increasing numbers of uh, foreigners, round-eyed barbarians. Russians from the north, Portuguese and Spaniards from the south and the ocean, and Matteo Ricci's mission to the Ming court bears fruit with a change of dynasty. The Manchu dynasty, or the Qing dynasty, takes over in the early 1600s. And the greatest, most dynamic, most powerful, most forceful ruler of China's Manchu Empire is the Qiangxi Emperor, who in the early to mid-1500s genuinely considers converting to Catholicism. And if the Qiangxi Emperor had converted to Catholicism, if the fans bothering you, feel free to move. Uh, China would have largely, officially at least, converted to Roman Catholic Christianity and the entire history of everything would have been different. But if you remember, the Kangxi Emperor does not convert to Catholicism because he is the Pope. The Son of Heaven, with the mandate of Heaven, is the exact job of the Pope, God's chief human. 
the idea of the Pope abiding a Chinese partner or a Chinese emperor abiding a European partner is, is crazy talk. So uh, since the Catholic Church refused to make the Kangxi Emperor their new Pope um, as a price for him converting uh, himself and his empire, um, China decides to go to the other extreme. China closes the door. The problems of others are not our concern. From the 16, early to mid-1600s until the early to mid-1800s, the Manchu dynasty of China would have as little to do with outsiders as possible. Now, what this means is that when the British show up in the late 1830s, 30s, and early 1840s with industrial-era equipment, including a paddle-wheeled steam warship, the Chinese really don't know how to react. Britain has been trading in a low-grade way with the Manchu Empire of China. But the Chinese demand that whatever the British buy, they buy with silver. They're not going to take trade. They're not going to do exchange. They're not going to take anything else. They want silver. So in order to trade for Chinese tea, Chinese silks, Chinese porcelain, and all of the other wonderful products of China... The British Empire has to denude its silver reserves, that is, spend them out. And this is no way for a free trade empire to, to, to do business. So the British try all sorts of things. The British try importing woolen goods made in British factories. The Chinese have cotton and silk. They don't need woolen goods. In fact, China, unlike Europe, is capable of an economic aut autarky. China, unlike Europe, is capable of doing fine without too much outside trade. Ah, oh, I'm distracted. I just said. What? It's tired. It's tired. Wake up! There's all sorts of things going on in the world. There is. There is. In any event. Uh, so the Chinese won't buy any of the British goods until somebody decides, you know what? Afghanistan's just north of British India. And Afghanistan's the global source of opium, which comes from puppies, puppies, puppies. So what we're going to do is we're going to grow opium in northern British India <laughs> and import it across the Afghan border through the Khyber Pass, <laughs> and we're going to smuggle it to China. <laughs> and trust me, once we addict enough Chinese drug addicts, um, they're going to be happy to uh, buy our goods without us having to sell us goods, without us having to sell them silver. We'll just trade opium. <laughs> it works. Uh, the Chinese people have a number of depressed folks, which is true of most any society. I mean, America is disgustingly um, prone to drug addiction and alcohol addiction. It's a sign that we are spiritually in deep, deep trouble, but most people don't want to notice that. Oh, no, everything's fine. Yeah, we can get rid of God. We can get rid of church. We can get rid of community. We can get rid of family. We can get rid of gender. We can get rid of everything. Everything's better. Change is better. Equity, di diversion, inclusiveness, all good. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, we have uh, methamphetamine, fentanyl, uh, crack, cocaine, uh, heroin, and all sorts of other drug no. uh, epidemic uh, because we're just fine. Yeah, we're, we're, we're totally okay as a people. Well, the Chinese have similar problems. So the British start importing opium. Uh, now, the only place they can trade is the city of Canton, which today is called Guangzhou. And the Chinese government does not like this at all. Who would? So the Chinese government sends a guy south to become the new governor of Canton in the southern region of China, where the foreign devils come to trade. His name is Lin Shi Shu. Lin Shi Shu uh, gathers up the opium from the known uh, warehouses where the Europeans uh, have been storing it, and he brings it all to a dock, and in front of the European uh, 
uh, settlement burns it all. Governor Lynn is hardcore about stopping this spread of uh, evil opium. Who could blame it? Well, the British considered him not only a threat to the opium trade, but a threat to the tea trade, to the porcelain trade, to the silk trade, and everything else. So um, there's now a conflict. Governor Lynn will not back down, and the British will not back down. So we have the 1842 uh, Anglo-Sino-English uh, uh, Opium War, where the British spank the Chinese. The Chinese have warships that are medieval junks. They're called junks. They have big silken sails or bamboo sails. Uh, the British warships are modern sailing ships that can sail close into the wind, completely outmaneuvering the Chinese. They have better cannons that can outrange the Chinese, and they have an aforementioned paddle-wheeled steamer that can go against the wind and do whatever they want. On land, the British are equally superior. The Chinese are spanked. They're humiliated. The peace treaty gives the British the island of Hong Kong. This is the beginning of the Crown Colony there. The rest of the world takes note. A few years later, the British uh, have another war with China to take the new territories, uh, which is the mainland portion of the Hong Kong colony. And the British begin to get concessions that allow Britain to trade closer and closer to Beijing. Oh, and Governor Lin was uh, removed. The opium trade is going to be allowed. Not officially, of course, but unofficially. With this begins the, what the Communist Party of China calls the century of shame. A century where the late Manchu Empire and the Chinese Republic become the whipping boy of every modern power. The British fight wars and get concessions. The French fight wars and get some concessions. Uh, the Italians, the Austro-Hungarians, the Germans, all get concessions of one kind or another. Even the Americans get into the act. Now, the Chinese do not like this. I don't mean the government, I mean the people. And so China sees the Western world as something that is a disease that they need an antidote to. The Western world violates Zheng Wu, Middle Kingdom, the notion that China is the central human empire. Because for the first time, China has to recognize the fact that they are not the dominant power in the world. They're not the most advanced power in the world. They're not the most powerful military in the world. They're not the most powerful culture in the world. Westerners have uh, gone past them in every possible way, except raw population numbers. So thoughtful Chinese begin to think about how they can uh, take in some Western qualities, sort of like an inoculant against the rest of the West. The first result of this is not only the Christianization of certain groups of Chinese, but what becomes the most bloody war, civil war in Chinese history, the Taiping Rebellion, which isn't in your notes, but should be, right before the Sino-Japanese War. Tai, T-A-I, hyphen Ping, P-I-N-G, Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion lasts almost 20 years. It involves most, at one point or another, most of the inland provinces of China. The Taiping are led by Jesus Christ's younger brother. That's who the man thinks he is. He's a Chinese Christian, quote-unquote, prophet. He has a superficial understanding of Christianity, and he declares that he is Jesus Christ's younger brother here to bring the truth to China. His army almost overthrows the Manchu Empire, creating a new dynasty. It would have been a pseudo-Christian dynasty, but it would have been a dynasty strong enough to kick out the Western powers. So what the Chinese imperial government, who hates the round-eyed foreign devils, does is it petitions the Western government for mercenaries, for soldiers for hire from Europe's armies. The English are particularly good at stepping up. And so they have a guy named uh, Charles Gordon, who becomes known as Chinese Gordon, uh, who takes on a group of Chinese soldiers and trains them in modern British warfare. This army is called the Ever Victorious Army. 
and Chinese Gordon and the other Western missionary, uh, mercenaries, not missionaries, mercenaries, so for hire, um, fight the Taiping to a halt and ultimately crush them. In the name of a Chinese empire that is backward and primitive, they are employed to stop a modernizing Christian, pseudo-Christian Chinese force. The Taiping are suppressed, but it is with great bloodshed. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. What? Um, so did you say that that guy came as a prophet? Yes. He claimed to be Jesus Christ's younger brother, a prophet slash messiah. Again, his understanding of Christian belief was superficial. Well, and, and yeah, it's funny because the last verse in Revelation, um, it says that anybody who comes claiming to be a prophet shall be, like, basically smited against God. Hmm. Well, but that's at the end of Revelations. God has already worked out his point, his uh, purpose by then. The point is, what the Taiping really were about, and why the Taiping were so successful, is that they took on a Western quality, Christianity, sinicized it, made it Chinese, and then uh, rolled with it to such an extent that they almost take over the country. From that point, this is what every other Chinese nationalist group is going to try to do. Because they realize that traditional China won't work. Now, this is brought home further in 1894. We're going to learn about what Japan does in relation to the West. But the Japanese, in essence, try to become more Western than the Westerners. And with a British-designed navy, a Prussian-designed army, an American-designed design industrial uh, uh, sector. In 1894, Japan fights China, takes Taiwan, takes Korea, uh, gets concessions just like the Europeans. So now the Chinese are not only being humiliated by the round-eyed hairy barbarians from Europe, but they're also being uh, victimized by the stupid island people who up until this point have aped everything that China did. If you want to know where samurai clothing comes from, it comes from Tang Dynasty China. Japanese uh, kanji come from Chinese characters. The Japanese are an echo of China's culture, Chinese belief, and, and with some good reason. And now the Japanese are strutting around China's streets, doing whatever they want above the law, because that's what concessions really are. British in China, Americans in China, Germans in China, uh, Austrians in China, Italians in China, um, Japanese in China are above the law. They can only be tried in courts of their own nationality. So if I'm an American sailor in a gunboat up a Chinese river, which we begin to deploy, and I decide that I want to have a particular Chinese woman and because she's Chinese, I don't really care whether or not it's rape, and I do that, and I'm guilty of sin, and they catch me in flagrante delecto doing this horrible, horrible deed, the Chinese authorities have no power over me. They'll bring me to the U.S. Navy, to my ship, and I will be tried by my fellow Americans. So what happens is that the Europeans and Japanese who have these concessions in China, really are untouchable. They are above the law. And this is something that infuriates the Chinese, who are deeply proud people. So this all comes to a head in the year 1900. China has had a series of weak emperors, but the strong person in the court is the Dowager Empress Shi Li. Shi Li. The Dowager Empress Shi Li, or Shi Si, it depends on what translation you have. The Dowager Empress is the has been a, a a wife, a mother, a foster mother to a bunch of weak male emperors. She's the real power. And what she decides to do is encourage a group of martial arts societies, the fists of righteous justice. The fits of flaming outrage to wage a traditional Chinese war against the foreign devils. This is called the Boxer Rebellion. And it should be the topic of, and in fact, it is the topic of a couple of kung fu movies, chop movies out of Hong Kong from the 70s of Bruce. 
Bruce Lee, a uh, great martial arts hero from that era, made a movie about this. And so what you have are kung fu masters fighting modern armies with rifles. Now, in a Chopsaki Hong Kong Kung Fu movie from the 1970s, of course, the Kung Fu masters are going to kick and fly and pound their way to victory over the stupid foreigners who only have their guns. In reality, the most dedicated master who can focus his key energy and uh, you know, walk on a bed of nails and walk across hot coals and break a, a set of bricks with his hand and do all the other focused things that kung fu masters can do uh, are still going to have their chests blown open by a rifle bullet. So the Boxer Rebellion at first succeeds at isolating a group of foreigners in Peking for 55 days. And then everyone the British, the French, the Germans, the Austro-Hungarians, the Italians, the Japanese, the Americans, what the Chinese communist historians call the Eight Power Alliance, um, combine to crush the boxers and free the, uh, the European uh, and American and Japanese delegations in Beijing and Peking. And they do this. This is the last gasp of traditional Confucian China in the face of the West. The boxers eschewed all sorts of Westernisms. Unlike the Taiping, they didn't take on a Western idea to inoculate themselves against Western imperialism. They just rose up with traditional China, and they got slaughtered. And the Dowager Empress was weakened, and she died soon after that. So, it looks like China is going to be carved up by the European empires. In steps Theodore Roosevelt, President of the United States. And Theodore Roosevelt extols what is called the Open Door Policy. The Open Door Policy is an American proposal that no one take additional territory in China that the territorial integrity of China be maintained so that all foreigners can exploit it without being held back. America sent missionaries deep into China to try to Christianize the Chinese people, with some success. So did the British. Uh, the French had business interests. We helped build railroads. The Japanese did stuff. Uh, everyone had business interests in China. Everyone who was anyone in the developed world had concessions in China. So Roosevelt's proposal is to avoid China being destroyed by being carved up, to preserve China for at some point of the Chinese people, but also to make possible the maximal exploitation of China by outsiders, that China have an open door to everyone and that nobody try to close parts of China off into different colonies. Roosevelt's action probably saves China from being divided. This is something that communist Chinese historians often forget. Why? Because the American people have an interesting relationship with both China and Japan. China has always been a topic for American idealists to dream about. In the 1930s, a woman named Pearl Buck writes a book called The Good Earth about Chinese peasants dealing with the difficulties of being a Chinese peasant, including locusts, bandit lords, and disease, and so forth. And the Chinese peasants, and this, and this was turned into a movie, an early movie, uh, were basically the absolute salt of the earth, natural Christians, even though they're not at all Christian, uh, just good, generous people. They're basically people from Iowa. They're people from uh, Ohio. They're people from the Midwest. They're basically Americans with yellow skin and pointy eyes and, and funny ling lingo and eating a lot of rice. They're, they're, they're just good people. So American idealists tend to project their hopes onto this thing they know nothing about, which is the mass of the Chinese peasantry. And Americans hope that the Chinese will take their place among the great peoples of the world as a free people beside us which is one of the things that leads to a variety of China policies, which, for better or worse, made China rich and powerful with our money. Um, the 
the result is a China that has gunboats, which are river craft armed, of the Royal Navy of Britain, of the French Third Republic, of the German Empire, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of the Spanish, of the Portuguese, of the Japanese, and of the American Navy, all going up and down their rivers, protecting their citizens, making sure that order is maintained, because the imperial government is so weak it can't stop that. In 1912, ultimately, the Chinese Empire is finally overthrown, and a new republic is proclaimed by a guy named Sun Yat-sen. S-U-N-Y-A-T-S-E-N. And you think, okay, Sun Yat-sen, Chinese Republic, founder of the Guomindang, the Chinese National Party. It's all going to be good now, right? China descends into warlordism. Local bandits take over areas and China, in fact, even though it seems to be a giant unified empire, is divided township by township, county by county, city by city, region by region by these warlords, each of whom is a law to himself. Meanwhile, the national government tries to take control. So China is one of the few colony countries on Earth not formally colonized by Europe. But China is definitely dominated by Europe, to such an extent that in the British concession at Shanghai, which is territory that flies the Union Jack and operates under British law, there are guard, uh, gardens that say no dogs or Chinamen. <laughs> because it's a British garden. It happens to be on Chinese soil, but it's a British garden. All of this humiliation is stoked by the Chinese communists to bring xenophobia, hatred of outsiders, a hatred of the foreign devils. The British are the red-bearded devils. The Americans are the furly flag devils because we have, you know, our flag is sort of colorful and furly. Um, the Chinese react to the foreign world with disdain, with contempt. We're better than you. And they never get over that. The only people who try are the Taiping and later the Communists and the Guomindang, the Nationalists. They all try to take on Western ideas to modernize China so it can become a peer nation, not a victim. Any questions about China during this time? Okay. Um, I will talk about Japan tomorrow. If you have good and thoughtful questions about the current moment, I will tell you the pipsqueak Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, has withdrawn his emergency order and claims that he will un be unfreezing the accounts of the truckers. I think that's good, but I also think he still took freedom away rather than deal politically. I still think it's a problem. And since... Uh, there are people in jail. I, I'll, I'll believe it when they're out of jail. And, of course, uh, in the middle of the night last night, I learned that uh, President Putin of Russia has decided to abandon his pretext of liberating the poor Russians in, uh, as minority po populations in the Donbass, the Donetsk Basin of eastern Ukraine, and just declared war uh, and a state of full-scale invasion. Uh, I, as I understand it, uh, Kiev has been bombed, and uh, the entire Ukraine is under attack. This is the largest war since the end of World War II. It's already, just in terms of numbers, bigger than Korea, bigger than Vietnam. Um, at this moment, my understanding is that the West is responding, responding with sanctions. I do not yet know if these sanctions really bite, really bite. Not only the sanctions need to be against Russia, they need to be against the leaders of Russia personally. The bank accounts of Russian oligarchs uh, need to be taken from them in the case of those who deal with banks in the West. There are things that can be done to really leverage. Also, every energy resource in the United States, including the Keystone Pipeline uh, and oil exploration, should be opened up again immediately to lower the global price of oil. 
whether Biden, Biden has the willingness to do that, because he's such an environmentalist, I don't know. In fact, climate czar John Kerry remonstrates that the war might interfere with his climate change agenda. I have no words. I have no words. So there are hundreds of thousands of men in Russia's army and hundreds of thousands of men in Ukraine's army uh, who are now engaged in some form of struggle. For my own part, I hope the Ukrainians fight because giving up their freedom without a fight would mean the definite loss of it. For my own part, I also think that in addition to sanctions, we should give the Ukrainians, if they set up rebel movements, uh, missiles, weapons. And due to the Russians in Ukraine, what was done to the Russians in Afghanistan, which is bleed them, because they did it to us in Vietnam. I think that the Eastern European nations, including the Baltic states, including Poland, uh, including Hungary and Czech, uh, the Czech and Slovak republics, including Romania, uh, who are already parts of NATO, should mobilize their military. And if Putin moves into white Russia, Belarus, or Moldova, that may be pretext for general war. But it's certainly if he tries threatening any of the NATO countries, that is general war the biggest war since World War II. And trust me, the Chinese will exploit this. They will take Taiwan if we don't handle this right. Part of me would just like to say to hell with Biden. He invited this, his weakness caused this, which I believe is true. But the peace of the world is at stake, so I'm conflicted. You had first question, you had second. Uh, so, I have two quick things. One, uh, this woman was telling us that her adopted sister lives in Ukraine right now with um, boyfriend, mm -hmm. and she should get out. They, yeah, well, they're trying, but they can't find gas. All trains are down, and so it's out of plans. Yeah, but he was able to find some gas, so they're on the way. Good. I hope then, they get there safely. They should have left weeks ago. Yeah. Go on. Um, and then my parents, after school today, are going to stop for box some more food because there's supposed to be massive shortages right now actually just from Canada and the United States as mm -hmm. far as food. So you're going to be sending food over there? Uh, that... Well, we're just stopping up at our house. And, ah, okay. Um, our neighbor. So a lot of people are kind of under the assumption that it's very, sorry, it's so small. Okay, then I'm going to say, maybe not. So, I mean, they're both they're in their own. But on social media, the, the Ukrainian army posted a picture of the following the T-72s and BTRs and things. <laughs> Look, Russia is almost like Janus, the old Roman god with two faces. The Russian army can be the most terrifying land force in human history. And it was in the Napoleonic Wars at the end of World War II. When Russia really gets going, it's impressive. No question. But then there was the Crimean War, where the Russians couldn't protect themselves against the British and French. There was World War I, where the Russians fumbled fighting the Austrians, as well as the Germans. And there was the, every, you know, when Russia moved in, into Hungary and, and into uh, uh, Czechoslovakia during the Cold War, um, the Russian army at peace is not always a very good force. I think it's entirely possible that a lot of what Putin is doing is bluffing. Because I think he's really doing this, not just to please the Chinese, but because he's domestically weak. Yeah. And so Russia's army may, may actually not function very well in, in the actual hotness of combat. I, I, I can't read. But what language are you speaking? I, Ukrainian. 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 Yeah, I can't, I can't read Ukrainian, but I saw the word javelin in there, which mm -hmm. I wonder who gave the most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, understand, though, uh, a cornered animal is incredibly dangerous. And if Putin feels cornered, um, but then again, he's already doing a lot. He took Kazakh. You may not know this. A month ago, uh, Russian troops occupied Kazakhstan. Big deal. And that's that's huge. Um, yes. I was watching the live emergency meeting for the United Nations last night. Mm -hmm. And because of circumstances involving the way the chair rotates, Emergency meeting was chared by the Russian. Chaired by the Russian Federation. Are you freaking <laughs> kidding me? And, well, no, uh, Putin, this is this is all part yeah. of the plan. And so the <laughs> I'm watching the ambassador for Ukraine. He gets mm -hmm. the news that it, yeah. his country is just invaded by Russia. Yeah. Uh, he tells the Russians that um, war criminals do not go to 
Like they go, they go straight to the bottom of hell. Yeah. And then uh, Russia doesn't respond, and they just say they call Ukraine's government a junta. And then uh, which is it. basically a cheap South American military dictatorship. And then they end the meeting because <laughs> Russia. Look, understand that the Korean War was a UN war because the Russians were boycotting the UN in 1950. And therefore, the rest of the world got behind defending South Korea. Had the Russians been there, it wouldn't happen. I love Russia. I love Russian culture. But Putin is not my favorite Russian. And, yeah. So, there are further sanctions on Good. at the top I hope so. Um, because a lot of these... Good. No, a lot of these people, they really live above their own citizens. It's not like... Putin is a man of the people. He and his oligarchs are above. They're like old medieval lords. And if you sanction Russia and everyday Russians suffer, it's no skin off their nose. But if you sanction their personal assets, that's their fun. And unlike a bunch of peaceful Canadian protesters, I do believe that using banking as a weapon in this case is a valid thing. That's good news. Thank you. Yes. Can I just add on to the whole book sure. crimes thing? Uh, it was found that this morning... Uh, Russians did actually bomb a hospital? The Russians do not have the same capacity. Frankly, they don't have the same interest in precision bombing that we do. Because they understand something that we like to forget. And this is America's nabby pambiness. War is absolutely brutal. And if you fight it with brutality, you might fight a shorter, quicker, better war. The Russians understand this. The Germans understood this. We understood this in World War II and in the Civil War. Um, there are times when you have to be like the devil. And what you do is so horrific that it makes the enemy surrender. So I don't... We call these things war crimes. They would just call it war. Yeah. And frankly, our own ancestors would do the same thing. Anyway, any other thoughts? I've given you a lot of my thoughts. Do you have any? I brought this up because it, it is absolutely current events and it is absolutely important. Like, how do you what it said? I know that he recorded it beforehand. Do you want to point out anything in particular? He so said that if any country interferes with this, the consequences will be bigger from nothing that the world has ever seen. Well, um, I, I would take Putin seriously in this sense, but I also wouldn't let him blackmail me. But he also was still going narrative that there's like genocide and he's helping the Ukraine. Oh, yes. Russian, Russian citizens. Yes. Yeah, just like Hitler helped the Germans of the Sudetenland. We'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, no, it, it, it's some nasty stuff. Uh, and frankly, he can threaten all he wants. Um, Turning Moscow into a nuclear glass uh, desert is an option. I don't want to do it. I don't want to see nuclear weapons used at all. But the Soviets would never have done said what he just said. They understood that you don't that if bringing nuclear weapons in really does possibly break doomsday. So that's to me that's a sign of Putin's amateurishness. But it is something that is certainly attention worth. Uh, I hope uh, that your family is well, and I hope that you uh, don't have any difficulties as a result. We have had students, exchange students from Lviv um, in Ukraine. We've had uh, exchange students from uh, Almaty in Kazakhstan. Uh, they're in my prayers. Anyway, have a good day. You as well. Thanks.